A man who wears the 10 pounds of gold. The nature boy, Ric Flair. You know, I always like to take this opportunity to talk about myself. The 16-time heavyweight champion has arrived. I've got the star and profile like never before. The greatest talker in the history of the business is behind the mic once again. You're talking to the roller wearing diamond ring wearing kiss stealing whoo, wheel of dealing limousine like jet flying son of a gun whoo. This, this is Woo Nation with Ric Flair. I'm the man. All right, we're getting rolling here on Woo Nation, and we are on location in Dallas again with our most requested guest. Isn't that right, Rick? By far. I mean, we have interviewed a lot of people, but nobody has entertained our particular audience more than David Manning, the legendary referee, entrepreneur, and a man who currently, as we speak, after our night out last night in Dallas, is in hot water. David, tell the story. (laughs) Yeah, I'm making a new rule. We can drink after the podcast, but we don't go out the night before and the night of. <laughs> so uh, tell the story. It's great. Well, you know, we, we went over to uh, uh, Nick and Sam's, had yep. a phenomenal dinner, by the way. That's that, got to be one of the best in the country. Absolutely. And uh, good people we had dinner with and everything. So we came back here, decided we'd have one more drink. <laughs> And you and I got back so late yesterday, I didn't, get, I didn't get to go home and pick Terry up to bring her with me. That, so, that, would, that would be David's fiance. Yeah, so I call last night, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll be home just a little bit. So Conrad, after Rick goes up to bed, says, hey, uh, I'm going over to the club. To the ballet. To yeah, the ballet. Yeah, why don't you come go with me? And uh, I was like, oh, no, I got to go home. I said, but I'll give you a ride over. So I take him over. I sold it. Go in to... The ballet. No, and Conrad, he knew the owner and everything else. So I, <laughs> I go, I go in to meet the guy and everything, and uh, decide I'll have a seven up so that uh, I'm capable of driving home. So I get home last night. I told Terry, boy, you missed a wonderful dinner. She said, "What's that stamp on your hand?" <laughs> I said, uh, "I'll have to think about it, and I'll tell you in the morning." <laughs> <laughs> so what, the, what, so, is, what does Dan say? Uh, grade A. U- USDA grade A. USDA grade A. <laughs> well, that's too good for hanging around Conrad. Uh, well, here's the way I sold it to you. We're said, in David's town, Just too. an hour. Uh, we're only going to be an hour. One that's hour. That's my, my favorite line. Just, uh, just an hour. Well, how's it hurt, right? Yeah. Your wife won't know the difference. Come on. And he starts with just 7-Up, and then a bottle of Crown Reserve shows up. <laughs> yeah. Then you have to. You feel obligated. I mean, God. Did you fly that bottle in, or someone just bring it in? Uh, it was bottle service at the ballet. At the ballet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You played at the ballet in New Day? Uh, I went home, 635, 75. Yep. Stayed under the speed limit. Yep. My kids were all calling this morning after we talked to them yesterday. Yep. Rick told them I might be home by Monday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always like to allow for, you know, the variation of schedule. <laughs> well, you know, after the last podcast, all my friends that weren't around during the wrestling years were asking me, did I go to recovery or, you know. <laughs> I'm like, no, we, we only drank here and there. But the most of the time when we drank was when Rick was coming through and we were partying again. Thank you. I used to tell people I didn't know how Rick uh, would ever live to be the age you are because I don't know how any human, because he would leave me and go in the next town. He had somebody else and there he went again. Yeah, but I have someone like you. But <laughs> <laughs> the Dallas was a little bit unique, but I couldn't wait to get here. The only other territory I had as much fun in as with Dallas as with Dave was uh, Florida, and that just you know came natural. Fresh fruit everywhere. <laughs> yeah, not everybody picked up on that, but I did. Thank, Thank you. For that. And you know, it's, it you know more than I do because with the WWE and stuff. But uh, I was up uh, Kevin's Kevin Von Erk's kids, uh, 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 Ross and. Uh, uh, Marshall were wrestling up here in Sherman and Kevin called me and I went up and got a chance to see the boys wrestle and yeah. wow you're talking about talented you know yeah. 
I mean, they, I think they got Carrie and Kevin's genes put together because yeah. Marshall's about 6'5", wow. probably pushing 260 and can do backflips off the ropes. And, uh, is he going to the uh, NXT wrestling school? You know, well, they, well, they, they uh, Harley, they worked with Harley, mm -hmm. and they're doing most of their work over in uh, Japan. Oh, really? Okay. And so Kevin had called me, would I go up and help him out with a finish? And so I went up to Sherman and, and got a chance, got their just two great looking guys. You tell the whole story, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, they asked me to help them out with a finish, so I came up with a phenomenal finish for them. And I can't remember the guys they were working with, so I go up there and I lay this whole finish out. James Beard was there refereeing, so I, I laid that. James says, I love it. I love it. And then I get over and tell the guys that they're going to go up against, and they're going, but we're the champions, and we're not supposed to switch the belt. <laughs> like, well, that, that finish won't work. <laughs> so, so we'll do another one. But... Um, but they've come down here and worked a couple times, yeah. and uh, they did Old shoot, shoot mesquite. Uh, let's see, Ross is a little bit younger than my son, Sean, so I'm gonna say Ross has gotta be around 25, 26, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Marshall a little younger than that. He's probably, yeah. uh, I'd say Marshall's been out of, because he was a phenomenal football player in high school. Oh yeah. And uh, I'm saying Marshall's probably around 22, 21, 22. He didn't play college ball? He didn't play college ball. He actually had an academic scholarship. He could've oh. went to, uh, um, I want to say it's Army or one of them, yeah. and uh, but they're doing great in Hawaii. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Kev's got a great place there in Kauai, and I guess they, huh? uh, yeah, it's a phenomenal place. And he's got all the houses there, and uh, so he had the whole family up there. You know, unfortunately, yeah. Doris passed away about. Uh, yeah, which I was not aware of. They told me while yeah, we, when we had him on the podcast, Doris was was still with him. So yeah, yeah. so good well, times. You know, Kevin. We, we, a lot of people don't know uh, whenever. Uh, it was right after probably Mike's death. Um, Kevin really stepped up, you know, and was working there in the office and coming in a lot. Because up until then, you know, you know yourself, they were on the road. For, oh, sure. We were doing two shows a night. Yeah, I know. And then I Kevin know. came in and started helping some with the booking. And uh, matter of fact, he and I bought homes out in South Lake, so we'd meet at my house a lot and, yeah. and go over what we were gonna what we were gonna do then. And. Uh, uh, Good times. I keep saying I'm going to get up to Kauai. I don't know if you've been there, but man, he's got a great place. If you ever, if you're ever out that way, you know, knowing Kevin, I picture a place like Tarzan's in a tree. <laughs> well, he's still barefooted. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. He's still barefooted. I picture a place like Tarzan and Jane, right, in a big treehouse or Swiss, like Swiss Family Robinson. That's how I see Kevin. I mean, just the outdoors guy. You know, I mean. Well, unfortunately, I was on a cruise ship whenever they did the match here in Mesquite, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Sold out. They sold out Mesquite Stadium, and uh, how many people? Let me tell you, it was still there. I want to say it was about. I would guess about twelve thousand. Wow, that's wild. and uh, uh, could and be eight thousand. He managed, long time in there. He managed, he managed the, the two boys, but then he came in for the big pop and the claw, and that yeah. place just. You know how? Oh, you, sure. You know, I know. I mean, people don't know how much they were over here. It was great. Oh, it was, I it do. was great. <laughs> yeah, it was phenomenal. Well, go ahead, Dave. Give us a, give us the joke you gave us a little while ago before we had our first <laughs> middle night. Well, well, I gave Rick the joke of the day. I guess we can tell this on here, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 I ask him what the difference is in a tire and 365 used condoms. Mm -hmm. one's, a, one's a good year and one's a great year. <laughs> <laughs> ladies, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wu Nation. <laughs> so I want to talk the a lot about... The one and only David Manning and, wow. uh, and my good friend co-host and here in Dallas with us live Conrad Thompson second wealthiest man in the state of Alabama <laughs> owner of the Conradison which now as I have figured out depending on where he is in with in life with individual women is almost the second version of the Mustang Ranch oh which is in Reno Nevada so Conradison Mustang Ranch <laughs> Conrad Thompson so Hello. <laughs> you've actually been to both uh, the Conradison and the Mustang Ranch. I have. Uh, now I don't know that you've talked about that before. Tell us a Mustang Ranch story. A Mustang Ranch story. It's real simple. Um, it's nothing wrong with it. Um, we were with in Las Vegas or in Reno for the uh, NWA convention. Normally we had it in um, in Vegas, but for some reason we went to Reno and uh, and Jimmy Crockett. And uh, another person whose like, name I can't mention because he is still married and still alive. And I and uh, I, ooh, I better not tell the story. We got a block of that. I won't get in trouble. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still married. I'm not sure what to be cook. We'll edit this part of it. But anyway, I've been in the Mustang Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> I spent two thousand dollars back in nineteen eighty one. It's a lot of money to spend. That's a lot of money. A lot of wild horses. Yeah. They have. They yeah. have. They have, every room. They have like the, any you anything you can 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 conjure up in your mind that you might want to experience. You can experience. You got the money, honey. I got the time. Well, you know, for the longest time, I've never I, uh, I never went out there. Never got to go. But used to in a cab. Mm hmm. You could mention the name, and they literally gave you a menu, like you would have at a restaurant. Oh, it was of course. a menu in the cab. No, you, don't, you, walk, you know, you walk. It's still the same way. You walk in, sit on the order a drink, and they hand you, and then they come out and do the uh, they do the uh, circle of wagon to hold old blue. It's it's a different world now, man. They've got rolling billboards out there in Vegas now. Girls yeah. direct to your room. I mean, it's just out God, in the open. It's illegal, I'm, but that, out in the that, open. That, that's almost embarrassing. It is to think that people would participate in stuff like that. Dave, what do you think? Let me have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so something I want to talk about that we uh, we didn't capture on the podcast last night is I asked, hey, where did the Rolex thing come from in wrestling? Because it seems like everybody's got one. I mean, on down the line. And I, I learned something last night that I guess I should have known. But uh, as I sit here today, you guys are both rocking gold President Rolexes. Uh, where did that come from? Where did it originate? The man right here. Yeah, I just started wearing them. I don't know what it, it. You know, when I started wearing them, they weren't fifty grand a piece. You know what I mean? They were just thirty-five. <laughs> yeah, don't you wish you'd have kept all the first ones? You know, I kept trading them in like cars. You know, yeah. you trade you you upgrade. Uh, but well, I didn't trade mine in. I lost mine. Would have been the best investments ever. You have just kept them back when you could buy them for six to twelve thousand. Yeah, continuously put in weird circumstances where my watches would disappear. Strange. You've got a good missing rolex story is is it finally time to share that on the podcast mm, let me think it's it going into the new year i'm not married um it involves sabatinos i think yeah yeah probably pretty good so i'm at uh i'm with undertaker and kurt henning god rest his soul and horace grant who was playing for the washington capitals at that time right the That's bullets the, the bullets washington yeah. bullets and uh, we're drinking, having a good time, and and somehow I, those guys went their way, and I went my way, and because I had met some people during the day that I wanted to go downtown and eat with it, Sabatino's legendary, right? So I came back, and of course I went to bed, and I woke up in the morning, and there's two strangers. How they got there, I have no idea, right? <laughs> One on each side of me, right? So I go, hey, how you doing? And I went, how are you guys? Nice to meet you. I'm regular. You know who they were, right? They sure. must have just came in on their own. Got a key from the front desk. You know, I certainly wouldn't bring them in there. And I woke up and I went to get my stuff, and my watch was gone. Now these strangers, well, they have the female variety. Yeah. Oh wow. How they got there, I have no idea. But anyway, um, so I go to the girls. I go, um, I'm sorry, I don't know you guys, but but have you seen my watch? And they said, no. I said, come on, this is not funny. You know, it's, you know, it's a very expensive watch. And they said, well, we didn't take it. He said, you threw it in a bowl of spaghetti last night at Sabatino's and said, you had 11 more of them, so what the hell? <laughs> so um, knowing that I couldn't call the cops because I probably would have created a little you know, animosity at home, even though I didn't do anything. No, of I just, course not. Yeah, just innocently found a victim again. And... Uh, you gave refuge to some strangers. I gave refuge to strangers, right? I mean, sometimes you just yeah. can't turn people down, right? Sure, yeah. Send them out in the cold. I mean, you can't have them, right? So no. We, it was November in Baltimore. It's very charitable of you, right? So, anyway, Earl Hebner and I went down and went, went through the dumpster looking for my watch. And <laughs> Sabatino's and I had, of course, I called Kurt Henning. I said, Really Kurt, process what you just said. Rick Flair, the mm. world champion, mm -hmm. is dumpster diving. Yeah, and don't I've been looking for a forty thousand dollar Rolex, right? Because <laughs> uh, I had to go home the next day to Thanksgiving without my Rolex. So <clears throat> I called Kurt Hang. I said, Kurt, I'm going to be in Cincinnati late. I lost my watch. These chicks stole it. You know what the hell? What can I do? Um, so he said, Okay, I won't tell anybody. I said, Please don't tell anybody. So bingo. I mean, look at what can't find it. Get to Cincinnati. I walk in the door, knobs hollers at me, Hey, Flair, what time is it? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Kurt. Of course. So then, after the matches that night, I had to, the next day, I had to fly to Philadelphia, 8 a.m., call my friend Robbie Kane off, go into a jewelry store there, and buy a brand new watch. It was identical, except for the fact that it had baguettes instead of the 
regular diamond face, yeah, right? Yeah, same bezel. Squares right? instead of... Yeah, so I'm sitting there at Thanksgiving dinner, Megan, David, you know, and uh, <clears throat> Beth and whoever else was there, and uh, Megan goes to me, Dad, you got a new watch? I said, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's not the same watch. I said, yeah, it is. But, and she wouldn't stop. And I was like, oh, Dad, come on, you can tell us. It's really And this nice. is at the Thanksgiving table? At my house at Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. she'd wear me out about my new watch. So finally Beth goes, you going to watch? I said, no. <laughs> then, then came that look. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> nothing. I know nothing. To this day, I haven't admitted it. <laughs> you can't tell them the truth, you know that. How great is that? Yeah. It's the world champion, don't I, I wouldn't have wanted a Yanker scholarship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 what, what, one night, uh, I lost my wedding ring. Oh, this I did. This, that was, one of, this was one of my exes. I've that one of my, so my ex times. didn't believe me. You know, she didn't believe me at all. And she was like, uh, you know, you threw it away. You didn't wear it. You didn't blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I really didn't lose it. And so we go out and we buy a brand new one. Well, you know, going into the ring, you never wore the ring in the ring never, because in case God. you break your finger or something, you can't get it off. So I take it off, put it in my pocket. I've only had it two days. So I come, this is Monday night, we're at World Rogers Coliseum. Yeah. I come back, I'm getting dressed, I put my shoes on. Got was my that with you? On. It wasn't me that night. No. So I reach in the pocket, pull the ring out, and I drop it. And it's rolling, like it's just rolling across the floor. So Bill Irwin's standing there, and he turns around and sees it. He thinks it's a coin and stomps it. <laughs> to stop it. Wow. He mashed that summit so flat. I mean, it's like mashed together, and I'm like, oh, shit, she's never believing this. You know? <laughs> Two days I had it. <laughs> uh, well, some people just aren't meant to wear rings. I mean, I, so, I've, I've lost a few wedding rings, too, I assure you. We were, uh, we were talking last night, and, uh, David, you started talking a lot about the um, Yellow Rose of Texas and uh, what a big event that was when they wrestled in the Cowboy Stadium all those years ago. Uh, but you mentioned something that I don't think a lot of people know, and that's how popular the merchandise was in world class. And, and just in that particular show, what programs were, and all those details that I think a lot of people maybe don't give world class credit for. Oh, we, uh, I handled all the souvenirs, as Rick knows. And um, I mean, it was such a money-making machine. We back then you could buy. We'd buy the color pictures of mainly the Von Erichs, obviously, but we had the color pictures started out of them. I could buy them for twenty-four cents uh, on the high day, twenty-six cents, and we sold them for uh, three dollars back then. And uh, then when Iceman and gentleman Chris Adams and all the baby faces started really getting popular here, it, it turned into a major business. The Yellow Rose of Texas. We did a special uh, a program had the big yellow rose and David Von Erich and the, the, uh, the whole memory, the jacket, the whole works. And uh, at Texas A&M, we sold $102,000 just of programs. How much were the programs? Uh, the programs were $2. Wow. $2. Yeah. We sold 50-something thousand of That's them. That's amazing. And uh, <clears throat> not to mention the pictures. And then we had these badges. You know, one of the hottest things was buttons. Yeah. yeah. They, they would buy those buttons, and it would just be a snapshot of something going on in the ring or something. You know, sunshine. I, I, you wouldn't believe how much stuff we sold of sunshine when, yeah. when she was popular. Here, yeah. You know. And then the birds came, yeah. and the birds kind of switched everything because for the first time, they came here as baby faces because when yeah. Michael came, but then it's like we got, you know, six top yeah. In order to in order to make money here, you had to come in as a heel if you really wanted to make money because you wanted to work against Von Erichs, and it was the perfect matchup when they came. But they were the first ones. Even when they turned heel, they had a huge following. Oh, of course. So we yeah. would sell a lot of their merchandise. Kabuki. We sold yeah, a lot of. They, kabuki. they were like the modern day NWO. Exactly. Do you think they were really like the first um, cool heel gang, like cool heel faction? that was selling merchandise like that and was that popular because that was a couple of years even before the horseman right it was and they had some of their own stuff because when they came in uh, they were working with a guy named jimmy papa here and uh, they did the the uh, back then the cd um the album uh, the album they did the album you know bad street usa yeah. last yeah. house on the right michael can really sing yeah yeah and so um oh we used to do radio shows here in dallas we would do the radio shows for um Cliff and we would go in and they'd get Michael. Michael, you know, Hayes has got that voice oh, just like a DJ. I mean, Absolutely. he's got that. Baby's got her blue jeans <laughs> on. So he would crank Down it Down on the corner. But it was huge business. The souvenirs, I mean, and what, what we could have done with it, because we, we just started putting it 
Uh, actually, the guys, I can't remember the name of the store. There were some guys that had had, uh, had a hot franchise that was coming out with all the new, uh, uh, it would be, I would have to compare it to um, uh, the store that carries all the hot Levi's and the different kind of stuff. But they, they came in and wanted to market for us and take it. Back then, the internet was just coming around, yeah. and they wanted to sell on TV, which we had never done. You know, Kevin and I, we tried our best to get Fritz to pay for view the Texas Stadium show. Wow. I th and no telling what it would have done, because we had, we had people from all over the world riding in, trying to get here. Uh, and then, plus the fact at that time, that was the biggest wrestling event that had ever been held in the U.S. Oh, yeah. What you was know. it, 68,000? Uh, actually paid, it was 40-something thousand. Okay. The, the stadium only held 60,000. Okay. So we had everything but pretty much that far in and the top. Mm -hmm. And it stayed that way. That stayed the record until Vince did the Canadian show. Yeah. The, the WrestleMania there. Yeah. Well, the, for the, well, the one in, uh, the, the one in uh, uh, Michigan was mm -hmm. first. And then uh, Toronto was second. Yeah, up in, and up until here, Watts had the record for the, at the Superdome. Yeah, that's right, yeah. He had the, the JYD, the dog. Yeah. Yeah, I wrestled uh, Terry Taylor that night, and, and Muhammad Ali was the referee. Pretty <laughs> really? cool. Really? Yeah. 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 Well, very that's nice. very cool. Yeah. Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. Did Terry Taylor spend any time on World Class? Yeah, he came in a couple of times, but... He never really spent, you know, any any time here. It would just be like if we had a big show. We brought in uh, when we did the started doing the uh, Thanksgiving reunion arenas and the Christmas Day reunion arenas. We would have different stars come in. The one match I always wanted to put together that I think we could have probably sold out whatever we wanted to sell out was I wanted to put the Warriors and Kevin and Kerry together. Oh you know, yeah, the Road Warriors. Yeah. I mean, but they were hot. Yeah. I mean, everybody oh, was afraid true. of them. Their gimmick was yeah. so good. Yeah. yeah. You know, but we couldn't figure out how we'd do the match without them killing each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they were big time players. Uh, Mike and Joe <clears throat> were really a big part of the NWA. Absolutely. And uh, early WCW. And AWA, and I mean, everywhere they everywhere, were. Yep, they yep, were a big they were deal great. everywhere. Good workers, too. We, uh, we actually went to Twitter and asked some uh, folks if they had any questions for you, David, because you've been, like we said, our most requested guest. Uh, we got one from Brendan Smith. Um, were you, Rick, or David Manning ever concerned about working with Kerry when he was uh, quote unquote altered? Was that something that was a routine or regular concern or not so much? No, no. not really. Um, we dealt with it. Huh? Yeah. We, we dealt with it. Yeah. You dealt with it, and it, it, a lot of times it was overblown. Yeah, uh, and, and he was always very safe. I can say this regardless of. <clears throat> Whether I liked it or not, he was a nice kid. We all knew there was an issue, but he was, at, no matter what happened, he was very safe with me. And I let him press slam me, you know, slam me off the top, suplex me. It just, uh, the disappointing part for me <clears throat> is that he could have been, I mean, he could have been anything he wanted to be. Right. So if I walked away from it, it wasn't because we weren't sold out. It wasn't because it was painful or hard because I was with David having a good time. Sure. I was sold off because I felt bad that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to get what he deserved in terms of his athletic ability. I mean, he was a world-class discus thrower in college. Yeah. Right behind Mac Wilkins. You can look it up. He threw it, what, 198 feet or 200, oh, yeah. 208 feet at the University of Set Houston. the record. Had a, had a, yeah. uh, would have went to the Olympics, but that's the year they boycotted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he had phenomenal yeah. athlete. I mean. Fritz, Fritz held the record at SMU for years throwing the discus. Wow. Yeah. So he, so he helped personally help Kerry. They had a they had a ring right there at the ranch uh, out in Lake Dallas, and Kerry would throw out there. And Brian Adias, Brian Gower, Brian would mm -hmm. go over there and throw with him. Um, but yeah, I mean that's the thing about them. They were they were uh, uh, David was phenomenal at basketball. Right. Could have went on and played college ball. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin was North Texas the State. strongest as a freshman. Was the strongest. On campus, in a, on the football team, and the fastest, and was a running back, and then unfortunately never even got to do anything because he first of all he tears the left knee or might have been his right knee, tore all the ligaments. Back then you had to have the knife, right? So he, yeah. he's laid up for almost three months, and then he turns around uh, two months back and tears the other one. Yeah, he was in North, North Texas State 
home of me and Joe Green. <laughs> yeah. And that, actually, that's where uh, Steve Austin played, too, mm-hmm. right? Steve Austin. Yeah, that makes sense. North Texas yeah. State, yep. Uh, Brian Lee on Twitter writes in, ask David Manning the biggest rib from the Freebirds. There had to be some good Freebird ribs back in the day. Gosh. Well, I, as I told last time what they would always do with Buddy. I mean, their ribs were mostly always on Buddy. <laughs> you know, poor Buddy. I mean, they just beat the hell out of him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if he got drunk and passed out, uh, he's liable to show up with marks a lot all over his face and his eyes. And um, I'll tell you the best one. The best rib the Freebirds did was they're going to wrestle in the Superdome. They're leaving here. Terry and Michael are driving. Buddy's flying. Buddy's actually flying in and, and coming in with uh, uh, Bill Watts. And, and so the match is going to be Buddy, uh, Terry, and Michael against Bill Watts. I can't remember the other, the other two people that were on Bill's team. Mm-hmm. And it's the Dome, the big match. Well, as this is summertime. Driving through Louisiana, you know, the temperature is probably 110. Yep. Michael sees a possum on the side of the road, dead. Oh. Well, they've got Buddy's bag. Oh. So they stop, they take the possum, and they put it in Buddy's bag. And they zip it up, and they put it in the trunk. Oh, my. Now they drive oh for like my. 12 hours that to baking. get to the dome. And, and I mean, it's a, over 100 degrees. And you got to know Buddy to understand the joke. So they're in the dressing room. I, know. I wasn't there. But they're in the dressing room. And it's packed because they, they had like a 50-man battle royal. So this, the dressing room is packed, both the dressing rooms. Buddy reaches and gets the bag. Now, I don't know how many people out there have ever smelled death. Oh. But Buddy unzips the bag, and literally guys are throwing up. They're running out of the room. And Buddy just sits there like nothing's wrong, reaches and gets the possum, goes over and puts it in the can, puts his clothes on. That were in the bag. That were in the bag. And so then they got to have the match. And so they go out to the ring and they put Buddy on one side of the, of the corner and Michael and Terry get on the other side because they don't want to stand next to him. Sure. And so Gordy starts the match and he, and he and Michael are tagging in out. Well, as soon as Watts tags in, they tag Buddy in. <laughs> and Buddy goes and ties up with Bill Watts and Bill Watts says, what the F? And just throws Buddy through the ropes and is looking like, what the hell's happening? <laughs> That's <so amazing>. <laughs> 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 that poor, is awesome. Poor buddy guy. <laughs> Talking about in ring stuff, on the way to dinner last night, David, you shared a story about the time you refereed a match between Sting and Rick, and I thought that was priceless. Oh, yeah. Well, well I hadn't seen him in quite a while, and I came through. And, Sting, uh, you mean? Yes, I hadn't seen Sting in a while. I'd seen Rick, and so we get in the ring, and I'm looking at Sting. Well, to me, it looked like he had lost weight. Yeah. Well, you know, saying something like that to one of the guys that's working out every day. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I walked over to Rick. He's in the corner, and I looked at him, and I said, has Sting lost weight? He goes, call us to the middle. Hurry, call us to the middle. <laughs> so I go to the middle of the ring. I said, both of you come to the middle. So Sting comes to the middle, and, Rick, and Rick's got his finger out like he's talking to him, and Rick says, Manning wants to know if you've lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> of, course, of course I did. <laughs> Don't give me an opportunity to seize the, to seize the moment. <laughs> well, give us that a joke. Come on. Oh, I don't know. Come on. <laughs> well, I told him last night, if, uh, if you like to play golf, mm-hmm. two guys are playing golf. And yeah. so they're, they're, they're on the fairway and they tee off and they get stuck behind these two women. God, the women are playing slow and they keep thinking, oh, they'll let us play through. <laughs> So finally they get to this long par five and the two women hit down the middle and they're down there messing around. And so one of them said, that's it. That's it. I'm going to go down and I'm going to tell them we're playing through. And the other guy's like, go tell them. So he walks all the way down to the fairway. He gets about halfway there. He turns around and comes back. And the guy said, you tell them? He goes, Jesus, one of them's my wife. The other one's my girlfriend. He goes, oh, shit, you stay here. I'll go tell them. So the guy goes down and comes back. He goes, did you tell him? He goes, what a coincidence. <laughs> that is awesome. I can't take it. I could do this all day long. Every, I, I know any time I'm stressed out, I just, just need call to David be, Manning. Call David Manning. He used to do that. Yeah. I used he to, used to do that. I'd be there. Dave, Dave, I'm here with so-and-so. Here, give us one. <laughs> like I shit. couldn't ever remember the jokes. I mean, sure. if he oh, would get on a plane, he would... He would Cracked the flight attendants up telling them jokes. That was unreal. 
He told us one day we can't tell him the podcast. <laughs> tell the story at dinner last night when we're, when we're talking about real estate. And okay, so we're having dinner with my friend Chris here in, in Dallas that owns um, <clears throat> Fish Bones, really popular uh, restaurant. Right across the street from AT and T Stadium, we're going. Yeah. Actually, we're going to the game tonight. Cowboy Stadium, yeah. Going to Cowboy Stadium. We're going to go see um, Alabama Roll Tide versus Michigan State. David and I and Conrad and our spouses. And um, um, so <laughs> Chris says <laughs> to David, "Hey, I got a hunk of real estate right next to where my place is, and he would be interested in investing in it." And so um, <laughs> David goes, "Yeah, I might look at it." He goes, <laughs> "He said." I said, David's got the money to do everything he wants to do. So, <laughs> so David takes out the credit card. He, he throws him the, the platinum, right? Oh, yeah, he, first I throw the platinum American Express. Platinum American, and he goes, uh, okay, and then he throws him. No, he get, says, you don't have black, so then I pull the black out. I throw the black. So then Conrad starts throwing credit cards. No, he goes, yeah. I want to hear the tin one. <laughs> <laughs> and he, so after he got 20 credit cards on a table with about $30 million worth of credit on him, right? All of a sudden, David, man, he, David takes out 5,000 cash and puts on the table, right? And then he goes, he goes to my friend Chris, don't make me go to my, to my left pocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been hilarious, Kevin. What a time we're having. Absolutely. Don't uh, make me go to my left pocket. It's probably my second favorite. Oh, Maybe God. <laughs> the, the, the other joke he told today is my favorite. Yeah, that's pretty hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, we can't tell the kids. I'm sorry. Marv on Twitter uh, asked a great question uh, that I'm sure there's a fun story about. At the Sportatorium, uh, there was the little crowd crossing rope, and then there was a fan who kind of jumped over that and into the ring with Big John Studd when he was under a hood. Do you remember that? Is there a fun story with that? The only thing that was fun about people jumping in the ring, because you know what happens back then, <clears throat> and I don't know, maybe the same way now. It was really bad because if a, if, a, if a guy jumps in the ring, the the, the baby face really can't do anything to no, him because gotta... he'll get the heat. So guess who gets to beat him up? Me. <laughs> so I always got excited when somebody jumped in the ring. You know, one night one night somebody jumped in on Buddy Roberts and they just jumped on him. And I guarantee the guy's got a collar fly ear because I waffled him in the ear <laughs> solid about 10 straight times, you know. And, uh, but, um, you know, Big John Stud, though, anybody jumps in the ring, him, he was a big guy. Yeah. The it. best one was Kamala. Kamala was wrestling. And when he first came in here, Kamala goes outside the ring and some guy runs up behind Kamala. And, and, and I don't think the average fans realize how hard it is in the ring. They you know everybody thinks, oh, it's padded. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Some rings, as you know, have no pads. Mm -hmm. The ropes alone hitting that steel cable, mm -hmm. for a person that's never done it, it hurts like hell. Oh, yeah. it'll bruise them like nobody's business. But plus, they just, they're used to just taking punches after punch after punch. Well, Kamala goes outside the ring. Guy runs up behind him with a wooden chair, smashes it on, the back, on his back. Mm -hmm. And it would almost be like someone that gets bit by a mosquito. Yeah. Kamala just kind of flinched and then turns around. Yeah. And the guy runs like hell yeah you know? of course uh but that's what we do for a living know, they yeah. don't get it if you jump in the ring it was not good because they would make an example out of you yeah you know especially the hill yeah, in, in the carolinas in the south <clears throat> where it happened all the time they were really rough on the, on the guys that got in the ring really yeah, real bad yep uh marv who's obviously a big world-class fan sent a lot of great questions in this is probably one you'll like david uh, are there any examples you can list of Fritz's generosity to common people who were non-wrestlers? Yeah, well, Fritz, we uh, one, we took 10% uh, of everything that come through here and we put it in a fund. And um, uh, Fritz was real involved with the church out there in Lake Dallas. And um, so, especially around Christmas time, he wouldn't give people money, but he might take them and buy groceries, stuff like that. But we bought, uh, when we were doing the Easter Seals Telethon every year, we actually bought a whole wing out there, a playground that's, uh, till this day, it's called the David Von Erich Wing. Oh, cool. And after David died, that's what we did. We, uh, we bought a wing out there for uh, Easter Seals for the kids to play on that's with great. some specialty type swings and stuff. Yeah. But um, Fritz was, uh, you know more than I as far as paying out, but you know, seemed as though he paid out pretty good. Most of the guy, most of the boys like their checks when they come through here. Yeah. But um, um, but he was a hard guy to work for. Yeah. You know, 
uh, my job, you know, when I first started, but by the time it was all said and done, I was Fritz's right hand guy. Mm -hmm. And he and I would either talk on the phone or I'd go meet him every Thursday and we would literally go over what took place in the booking meetings. Yeah. And he kind of stayed on top of everything through me. But it was hard for me to delegate to other people things that I needed done. Yeah. Because if Fritz told you something he wanted done and you delegated it and it didn't get done, he could mm -hmm. care less who you delegate it to. Yeah. You were answering to Fritz. Right. Yeah. You know, um, I was fired more than uh, two times just because of the man sitting next to me, Rick Flair, coming to town. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Fritz, the last time he looks at me and he says, Look at me. You are not Rick Flair's personal freaking. He used a different word, chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't. We just had fun. Oh, we did have fun. Oh, did God. we tell the uh, Rambo story on the last podcast? No. Oh, just oh, the Rambo. This is, this is a classic. It never gets old. we got to <laughs> share this one. Well, Rick comes to town, and uh, Lex Luger, after the matches, so Luger, Rick, and myself. Yeah, Ryan is long gone now. We, we get a limo. And uh, we well we had the limo we left re, yeah. uh, we left reunion, so we go down. To, uh, Luger wanted to go to the Million Dollar Saloon. He'd yeah. heard about the Million Dollar Saloon, which was a big strip point downtown, one of the biggest, nicest. So we go down there, and uh, we go. Did I, a, did I ever go in? Yeah, well, you waited in the car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you were dumpster diving. <laughs> Dumpster diving. You're passing out scholarships. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we, uh, so we get down there, and there's three guys all night long that are heckling us, and they're really heckling Rick. And you know, every time, because uh, it was funny, because the girl that was serving us, Rick's convinced he's going to get her to take her top off. She won't do it. So every time she comes, he's like, there, uh, there's a table, and he keeps laying $100 bills out. Right there, honey, right there, take it off. She's like, no, no, I can't do it. So then she'd bring us another shot, and she'd have a shot, and Rick, he'd be added to the pile. Now there'd be like $600 bills. Come on. She said, oh, I can't do it. Well, finally, he's got over 1000 bucks out there, and here come all the other girls, and they're looking at her, are you crazy? Take the top off. So she ended up getting the money. <laughs> but, but anyway, we go to leave, and we're, I would say, luckily we had a driver. So we go out, and as we're leaving, um... I don't remember what was said, but as uh, Luger had already got in, Rick had already gotten the limo, I get in the limo, and just as I get in, the, the one loudmouth says something, and I don't know what it was, but it just kind of set me off. So we get in, and back then I had the, the watch, the nugget, the gold yeah. nuggets, the chain, $20 gold. He had, he, he had his uh, Mr. D kit on. Yeah, yeah, starter kit. And so uh, all of a sudden I start taking all this stuff off and laying it on the seat. I look at Rick and I said, and I thought he was just kidding. I mean, I didn't know he, he just. I mean, I've seen him do it before, but I thought, God, no way he's going to go out here. Sure enough. So I'm like, this is for you, Rick. So I get out, and they're kind of down this little hill, probably about 20, I'm going to say 25, 30 feet away. So the loudmouth is in the middle. Guy to the left's pretty good size. The guy to the right, a little smaller. So as I'm walking towards him, I'm kind of talking as if we're going to talk. But I'm already analyzing that I'm going to, I used to wear this big Texas nugget ring. So yeah. I'm just thinking I'm going to waffle this guy that's uh, loudmouth. And then I'm going to headbutt this one on the left. And then I'm going to kick this one on the right. <laughs> so I've got it all built out in my mind, right? So I get down there. Bam. Sure enough, I deck this guy from the front. Headbutt this one. Not enough time to get the kick. Here's the, this guy punches me and the fight's on. So the three of them were fighting and we fight all the way back up. You know, I got six fists coming from everywhere we fight all the way back to the limo we're behind the limo and luger and uh rick get out and i'm like no no you guys can't interfere till after actually, actually after david, round two david was doing real good he wasn't he, 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 so, he was he was backtracking but he wasn't giving ground so i, told him, I said you guys can't i was interfere. laughing because luger didn't know him i said i told you he's crazy <laughs> so i said you guys can interfere after round two so just as I go to plow into him again, I look, and here comes the police. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. So I go get in the car, and the limo's pulling out, and all of a sudden we hear on the window. So we roll the window down, the cop pointing at me, and he's like, come out here. So we, I get out of the car. He says, I'm going to have to put you under arrest. And uh, so he arrests me and the three guys, and he puts them in the back of the car. Well, the one guy that I hit... I caught him good with the ring. He is split wide open over his, uh, the, his uh, eyebrow. 
And so here we go downtown. I'm in the front seat. We're going downtown. The limo's following. I had forgotten this story. <laughs> so we go all the way down to, to, to the police station. And I have to go in. I have to get, you know, Finger go through all the, the crap hall, yeah. and the yeah. pictures. And so the cop comes in. He says, hey, the Ric Flair and them are out there waiting on you. <laughs> and uh, uh, Of course we were. Yeah, he said, here's the deal. When you go to court, I have to be there. You tell the judge it was self-defense. These guys jumped you. Because he said, there's no judge in the world going to think you were dumb enough to go jump on three guys. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I'll back you up. And he did. I went to court. Didn't get in any kind of trouble. We bailed him out. The way we went. That's awesome. Had a big meeting the next day. Met my friend Brian Dorsey. That's how first time I met him. I said, I have your shirt. I got to go to a meeting. He said, what the hell happened to you? I had my shirt was all ripped. And oh, Jesus, I looked like I'd been in a freaking. I was in. I wake up. I'm in Rick's room sleeping on the floor. And I'm thinking, what the hell happened? I'm looking at my face. and <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people wake up in your room with no idea what happened. I know, including, <laughs> including myself. I didn't but please. it was fun. So from that point on, when I'd show up at the matches, it was Rambo. <laughs> Rambo. <It> was. <laughs> Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. Hey, you got to tell the story. He doesn't know the story. And it, it's not one that's going to embarrass you, but it's fabulous. About a fighting with the guy over the over the uh, parking space. Parking space. The guy tried to kick you. <laughs> oh God, this was great. <laughs> this is when he was hustling in the bowling alley. Yeah. So anyway, so I got a couple of buddy of mine's with uh, buddy of mine. They uh, we ride up there, and uh, Bobby's in the front seat with me. And so anyway, I pull in to Chili's parking lot, and this was when I'm oh I don't know, 28, 29 years old, 27. I pull in, there's a guy backing out of a parking place. <clears throat> so he backs out a little bit, and I'm just going to wait on that space. It's kind of crowded, and so I'm waiting. Well, he backs out, and he stops. Starts backing out, and he stops. And I'm like, what the heck? And he backs out, right. but he's looking at me the whole time. And I'm like, just chilling. I'm talking to my, you know, my friends. And so finally, he backs out, and out of the blue, he just gets out of his car, and uh, kind of an oriental-looking guy, and he's like, you got a problem? And I'm, I'm looking at him like, I'm looking at my buddies, and Bobby's like, kick his ass, Dave, kick his ass, Dave, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like well, what the hell? You know, it's a, I'm like, I get out, and I'm like, I just want the parking place. And he also gets all obnoxious on me. So I'm like, okay, I will kick your ass. So I start walking towards him, and shit, all of a sudden he's like Jackie Chan. This guy comes <laughs> flying through the air, and gives one of these side kicks and he caught me right in my solar plex and knocked the wind out of me. Right. I mean, and you know, when that happens, you feel like you're dead. Absolutely. You can't breathe, you can't get a breath. I literally just went face down on the concrete and I remember seeing his license plates as he drove off. <laughs> so wow. I don't know, I guess he was just setting me up or whatever, but it was, uh, it was not cool in front of my buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Not cool in front of my buddies. Um, Marv wrote uh, some more great questions about world class. Um, specifically, this is a fun one. Uh, any stories about Missy Hyatt or Sunshine? He says more, but after that, but I'll just I'll delete that part. We won't we won't reference that. But Missy came up here, right? Yeah, Missy Hyatt was here. Uh, what a trip she was. Um, it, it's actually. It became major drama because first when Sunshine came, she was the valet for Jimmy Garvin. Right. Then Jimmy Garvin brings in Precious, which was his wife. Right. But Sunshine was actually a true relative. Oh, I didn't know that. And they end up getting into it for real. I mean, it's like, I'll never forget Lawton, Lock Oklahoma. We had a cage match that night. And so Garvin, uh, Precious, Sunshine, and Chris Adams, they're going to go at it. And I'm trying to have a talk with the girls backstage. Look, let's just have a good match. Sure. Oh, hell. As soon as her and uh, Precious got in the ring, it was true flat-ass cat fight. I mean, they were yanking hair, pulling. Um, but I guess the best Missy Hyde story was uh, we're at Texas Stadium. Uh, she was seeing John Tatum. She was also work uh, kind of like his valet. Right. And... Missy Hyatt and Sunshine are going to do a mud match. And so here we've got this huge, uh, kind of like a, 
rubber container we had bought. Years before the Attitude Era did this. Yeah. yeah. And so we, had, we, we filled it with mud. And the mud they used was so slimy, it was crazy. It was like super slippery. And uh, so John Tatum's wearing this really nice um, jogging suit. I mean, it's like, you know, probably $150, $200 jogging suit. It's really nice. So he's making, he's telling everybody, do not get the mud on me. So we go out there. <laughs> And I go out there, and I'm going to referee, but I actually, Rick Hazard was refereeing. I came out when Tatum was trying to interfere, so I come out, and I'm in a jogging suit. So I go out, and I hit the ring, and oh my God, Missy Hyatt and Sunshine are covered from head to toe in this mud. Well, they had, they had figured out, they had it figured out that when I got there, they're going to throw me in the mud. When I'm already dressed, I'm dressed, I've got, you know, my clothes, my wallet. So Tatum all of a sudden comes from behind, gets me, and is going to throw me in the mud. And I'm like, I'm telling you, don't do it. And it's a, it's a true fight to get right. me in the mud. Well, I'm like, fine. If I'm going, I grab that brand new yeah. uh, jogging suit he had on, and we all go in the mud. And uh, this is at Texas Stadium, oh, Missy Hyatt and Sunshine. Oh, yeah. And so pretty soon we get to the dressing room, and Missy's, all I can hear is I'm in the shower trying to get the mud off of me. And all I can hear is Missy Hyatt. And she's like, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. And I turn around and here's naked Missy Hyatt <laughs> covered with mud from head to toe. How was that? <laughs> Good back then. <laughs> and, uh, and John Tatum trying to wash the mud off of her. And it took forever to get the mud off of her. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. But uh, he, he was washing the mud off of her. He took his time. She, yeah. in, Israel, <laughs> in Israel, um, we went there during Passover. And so you can't, you couldn't have a fire, you know, people just didn't work. To, well, after about four days, every day we're eating eggs, raw, you know, the boiled and all of this stuff, and cheeses and fish. And so all of a sudden I get a phone call. You got to come over here. Missy Hyatt's thrown a tantrum. And she had literally, they had invited him to this special dinner with the rabbis and all this. Well, as she's going through the line, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just jumps up, starts throwing her food. I want a McDonald's burger. I'm tired of this shit. You know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, my God. And I got to go over there and deal with it, you know. And uh, that's when all the boys actually went in. I get up the next morning. I can't find any of the boys. And the guy comes, oh, my God, they're in the kitchen. They had literally gone back in the kitchen and told everybody, get out. We can cook. Is that right? Oh, yeah. They, all the boys, they had the eggs and bacon. and <laughs> Wow. Jesus. God, that's <laughs> and they've like, they, I walked in there, Manny, we're going to eat. <laughs> you don't say a word. <laughs> that's great. That's the trip Chris Adams. We'll tell the Chris Adams story when tell I had it. to get him out of the country. Yeah. That trip, um, the Hills were staying at one, one hotel. We were staying over at the Plaza. And uh, so I get a call. And because uh, I always got the calls, you got to get over here. Chris Adams beat up the bartender. So I go to the other hotel. Well, when I get there, there's an ambulance there and all this kind of crap. Well, Chris, you know, the, the super kick was a yeah, shoot. Yeah. I mean, he was really good. His brother was Olympic judo. Yeah. So Chris had got intoxicated, gotten in gotten an argument with the bartender and super kicks him. And the way he super kicked him, it knocked his eye out. Oh, my. I mean, for real. Out. Came out. And uh, then Chris just continued to beat him up. Wow. And uh, so I get Chris taking back over to the other hotel. So I can't remember this, this guy that he got in the fight with was, uh, uh, you know, over there you got like different tribes or different uh, things that people are part of, the Arabs. The, and so anyway, whatever they were, they believed in, no pun intended, an eye, an eye for an eye. So wow. they weren't going to take it. They didn't care about the police or anything. So Avi Friedman comes to me and he's like, "You got to get Chris out of here. You know they're gonna they're gonna come lock him up." Well, when you arrive there, they take your passports and they lock them in the damn safe. So Avi says, "I can't help you, but you got to get Chris out of here." And he said, "I'm just saying this tonight. The safe will be open." Mm. Yeah. So I go get Chris. And I said, "We got to get out of here." I said, I'll, "So we, we get the flight booked." <clears throat> so literally, at like. 12 o'clock at night, we sneak out of the hotel. I sneak down to the hotel. I go behind the, where they check you in, go back in the back. I go in where all the passports are at. I get Chris's passport, bring it out. He and I go out. We get a cab. We walk down the road a little bit, got a cab. We go to the airport. 
and we don't know if he's locked into the country or not. So we get to the airport, we go in, I watch him go all the way through, and once he gets through security and is gone, well now I gotta haul ass back because we're getting close now to four in the morning. I gotta go all the way from the airport back to the plaza in Tel Aviv. So I go back, I get there, park down the street, come back, go up to my room, get in my room, and I haven't been in my room 30 minutes till there's a knock on the door. Open the door and here's police. And they're like, you know where Chris Adams is? I'm like, no, I've been sleeping. And uh, we literally got him out of the country within about 30 minutes or he might have never left that country. Wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad. Yeah. We yeah. wonder why wrestling has a better reputation in some places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've, we've just, we, we've made some disastrous, so that we, we have left some places in disastrous You made an impression. Huh? Made an impression. Yeah, Jesus. So we were talking about uh, world champions last night here at the bar, and you brought up Luth S. And I don't think we've talked about Lou a lot on the podcast, and both of you guys had experience with Lou, and Danny Hodge came up. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Danny Hodge or Luth S. Well, I knew them both. Uh, and I actually, um, of course, I never wrestled either one of them. Um, but um, I was fortunate enough that they both liked me. Right. And... Um, um, we were talking about really tough guys in the business, you know, mm-hmm. and the difference between now and then and all that. And like, <clears throat> for Luthez, he was a world champion, but it was it, it was not a work. Lou thought he could beat anybody, right? And he took on all comers. All that- comers, and, 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 and the guys were afraid of him. He was tough. Yeah. Danny Hodge the same way, but Danny was easy going. Danny was just, uh, you know, but Danny Hodge was double tough, man. Yeah, crush apples with his hands, break no, pliers. No, more than that. Pliers. He could break a pliers. He had double tendons. Yeah, the apples, forget that. I mean, when he could take a pliers and crush the handles, twist off a shower knob in the shower, I mean, he with his grip, I mean, we got disqualified in the Olympics for breaking the Russian's arm with it, with the grip, with his grip. And with that, you know, see, uh, when I first got into business, Danny Pletches, Bulldog Danny Pletches, mm-hmm. was working actually uh, on the office side, but he would still work a little bit. But Pletch used to travel with Thez uh, all over the world. And Thez would take on all comers. So if there was anybody that thought they could beat Lou Thez and they were a tough guy or whatever, no problem, book the match. Well, after uh, Thez kind of started getting on up in age a little bit, what they would do is Pletches, if they thought they had a ringer coming in that he might have trouble with, they would have Pletches wrestling the night before and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, because uh, Pletches was another guy that was yeah. tougher than nails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you told yeah. a great story last night, David, about Harley Race with a bunch of bikers who thought they were badasses at a show. And he and Harley approached them. Share that story with yeah, us. Yeah, Iceman King Parsons, who was a big star here, Ice told me that uh, he was up uh, working for Don Owens mm-hmm. in uh, Portland. And so... Uh, after the matches were over, I guess these bikers, and I don't know what group it was, you know, back back in the 80s, you had the Hells Angels, you had others. But anyway, these bikers were there, and they were up causing some trouble with a couple of the boys. And uh, Harley saw it. And so Harley walked down to the ring in his flip-flops. He had his flip-flops on. He'd been in a shower. He walks down, just got a little pair of tights on, and um, walks up to the bikers and out of nowhere says, so you guys are tough guys, huh? And he said, which one's the toughest? Why don't you go a couple of minutes with the world champion? So one of them steps up. Look, I can kick your ass. So they get in the ring. I mean, within instant, Harley gut yeah. punches him, yeah. k- kicks him, pulls his head down, gets him in a front face lock, lifts up so hard, the guy peed himself. Wow. Yeah. So Harley was <laughs> tough. <guy. laughs> yeah. But Harley, would, what Harley did a couple of times, I've seen it. They never got through the ropes. The minute they'd been over, <laughs> they were coming through the ropes, just in case. <laughs> they never, they never got their head straightened up, man. Yeah. And he was left-handed. They never saw it coming, man. And he was mean. Wow. Yeah. The greatest story that I've ever seen and witnessed was one night this karate guy in West Palm Beach challenges uh, Harley. It comes in every week, right? So the guy comes through the ropes. Harley nails him. Boom! Kicking his butt. So. Four more guys jumped in the ring. Larry Henning was there that night, Kurt's father, right? Yeah. He takes the tube sock and puts the hockey puck in, right? He runs down to the ring swinging this damn thing, right? 
it comes. <laughs> this is so great. I've never told this story. He gets in the ring. Here's Larry, 365, yeah. 330 pounds, right? He's swinging his damn sock. It came all the way around and hit him right in the head. Knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> Knocked him to his knees. Oh, <laughs> damn, I, oh yeah. Harley didn't need Neo, but Harley would Kurt Rock, um, Make no mistake, Larry Henning was tough, too. Absolutely. Really tough, yeah. Funnier than hell, too. Yes. Great guy. I had hoped he'd come to Minneapolis last week at Raw, but uh, uh, Joel Kurt's son said that he, had, he just had too much going on. And in, in apparently uh, Joel's grandmother was uh, not feeling well. So, But Larry Henning's a classic. I saw his uh, induction at the Cauliflower Rally, and, man, he was yeah. the highlight. Yeah. He's, he had him rolling. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Yep, fearless. Um, great question here again from Marv, who's obviously a huge world class fan. I uh, wanted to know a little bit about the Brian Adidas and Von Erich story. Do you know the history behind that? Yeah, Brian. Brian uh, it was Brian Gower was his real name. Uh, still a very good friend of mine. Uh, Brian um, and Kerry grew up together, played football together at Lake Dallas, same grade, worked out together, and uh, so when Kerry got in the business. It wasn't long after he brought Brian into the business. And so Brian came in as a baby face and we called him Brian Adias. And uh, worked good, was always obviously, you know, in the middle, semifinals, stuff like that. And um, great athlete. And then uh, we got a pretty good run out of it when he turned on Kerry, because here they were. And the people, you know, the people here, and I always say this is what made world class so different. The fans saw the Von Erichs grow up. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, all the way back when Fritz would come to the ring and he'd have him, and Kevin wasn't more than you know, uh, uh, sixth grade, fifth grade. So, all of these people out there, they they lived it. I mean, these were like their boys. Yeah. And so as they grew up, and then when they broke into the business, um, and like Brian Diaz, that was the best run he got because he became a heel. He teamed up with uh, Chris Adams. Matter of fact, one of the big matches we had here was uh, Chris Adams, and Brian Diaz. Again, no, no, I'm wrong. That was Gino Hernandez and and Chris. We did the yeah. match uh, in the. Well, you guys had a major, major run of stars come through this territory. My God, David, you saw it all. We did huge. We it, online, you know, they still, you go online, you see all the stuff on YouTube. I don't know yeah. how they get it. Yeah. Somebody was watching the match of the day. I refereed with. Uh, it was Chris and Gino against uh, Kevin and Kerry, and we were in. Uh, uh, Will Rogers Coliseum oh, really? for the big one. Yeah. Actually, no, no, we were in uh, Fort Worth Convention Center for the big one, and um, it's where I took a bump and hung my neck in the ropes. Yeah, and, Joe uh, Dory Funk. Yeah, I, so I hung my neck in the ropes, <laughs> and I'll never forget because I told uh, Chris and Gino as soon as we start, grab headlocks <laughs> so nobody runs in and hits the rope because you know if yeah. you got your head in the ropes locked in there, yeah. and someone hits the ropes, it can it can snap your neck. Because I mean, I remember the first time I saw it, Red Bastine did it. Yeah. And I did, I had never seen the move and, before. And, it was a shoot. I and, thought he was dying. And then Dory did it. Yeah, yeah. Dory could do it good too. Hey, um, so tell uh, one of the greatest stories that I tell people. The, the, this is, it was a <clears throat> an example of how big the Von Erichs were. The deal was that I had to beat Mike Von Erich, who weighed 150 pounds, maybe 160, right, in 10 minutes, or I had to wrestle Kerry. So we went to the convention center in Fort Worth. Completely sold out, what, 10,000 people? Yep. Me against, and I got to beat him in 10 minutes. The kid was over so good, I took a blade. At the end of 10 minutes, I had him have to claw on me. <laughs> they went crazy. They went crazy. I mean, it was like, I mean, he couldn't do anything. He was a really a nice kid, but just not physically gifted like the other yeah. boys. But it was so over. I mean, I, they, want, they wanted me to put the figure four on them, and, and I said, it's not a chance. I took a blade, <laughs> like this kind of, and David thought they were going. David Von Erich, the ring, yeah. And David, David goes, what are you doing? I said, entertaining the crowd, man. That, it, was, it, was, it was classic. I had him take me outside, throw me in the post, did zip. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we came up. Well, you know, that was, that, we talked about Kerry throwing the discus. 
That's how we came up with, matter of fact, Vince used it when he went up to the Texas Tornado. Yeah, right. He would throw the discus punch. Yeah. So he would do the roundhouse like he was throwing the discus and hit him with the punch. And the, yeah. you know, it was the one punch. That was it. I took a lot of those. Yeah. When he could find me. <laughs> 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 Sometimes they were easy to duck. <laughs> Welcome to Play It, a new podcast network featuring radio and TV personalities talking business, sports, tech, entertainment, and more. Play it at play.it. David, you mentioned a name we hadn't talked about a lot on the podcast, and Rick, I'm sure you have some fun stories too. Red Bastine. Oh my oh God! My gosh, phenomenal worker. The bishop. Though. Yeah. <laughs> phenomenal worker. <laughs> you guys got any good memories? The keeper of the bishop, and then we won't say any more. <laughs> well, I, I can use my imagination. Is it, is it exactly what I expect? <laughs> well, you know, the first time I met him, um, I met him. Uh, he. Wasn't here in Dallas. I was refereeing in San Antonio. Yeah. And he came in and he was teamed with Lord Alfred Hayes. Yeah. Another guy that was a phenomenal worker. Yeah. Matter of fact, what was the guy that was a shooter? Um, it was Tony Charles and um, his partner. They were from uh, Australia or somewhere. It was Tony Charles or maybe Jeff, they were Jeff from. Jeff Forts? No. Oh, gosh. What was their names? All of those guys. Lord Alfred Hayes, they all came through here and. Uh, uh, phenomenal guys. But when I met Red Bastien, you know, we still do an event every year here in Dallas. Uh, Johnny Mantell puts it together. Mm -hmm. And it's it's based on Red Bastien, Bastien started it. And it's mm -hmm. where all the guys come back. Yeah. They're still around this area. And we all get together once a year. Yeah. And, the, uh, the irony of the, this all coming together in this question is that the night before I came here for the big stadium show with Kerry, I was in Portland with Roddy Piper. And uh, we we'll, 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 we'll want to say a few words about Roddy before the the show and Dusty, but and we were drunk. All, I mean, really, at the place called Red Lion on Jansen Beach, we didn't go. To, I had a six o'clock flight. I'm coming to Dallas, right? I already know what I'm doing, right? But it wasn't like it was hard to do, right? I barely made the flight. Piper and I and Red Bastine. Oh. Piper, I said, Piper, we're putting him to bed because Red could drink, and he always said he could put you to bed, right? Piper and I put him to bed, tucked him in. I went in my room, didn't even change clothes. Got in that plane, flew to Dallas. David picked me up, went to the hotel, changed clothes, slicked the hair back, walked in the building, and the rest is history. But I almost missed my flight. Wow. Well, we got, we got. Have you missed any more. flights this year? This year? I mean, like. Um, Maybe in Texas? Oh, God, I missed a couple with you in Laredo. <laughs> no, in Houston. Not talking to you anymore about that. That's not funny. Uh, yeah. That was hilarious. I drank myself right through three flights with Conrad one day. We were oh, celebrating. Bloody Marys, my God. Forget you know, it. You know, when you talk about Dallas, so I look all the way back. When I first got in the business, to look at the stars that came through here. Oh, of course. I mean, when I first got in, I, I was like a mark, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and you had Duke Kilmuka, you had Killer Carl Cox, you had um, uh, uh, The Brute came through here yeah. when, in one of his last few Brute shows. Bernard. Brute, The Sheik yeah. came through. And then here, I mean, uh, Big John Studd, you talked about him. We had the spoiler. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gary, Gary brought in the spoiler, John Jar Don Jardine. Yeah. And he brings in uh, uh, Mark Lewin. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes back of all the guys that's come through here. Yeah. That were. Market rock and roll. Yeah. You know, superstars and other places. Tommy Fulton and, and uh, Bo Bobby Fulton and yeah. uh, Tommy Rogers you know came Bobby, through here. Tommy Rogers died. Yeah, he did die. In Hawaii. Yep. What did he die of? You know, I don't even know. I I see. You He's know, a young I looked kid. at Facebook and I saw handsome? Facebook. I saw Bobby had posted some stuff, yeah. and I don't really think sad. it was good. I don't. Hmm? I, I think there was a substance. Oh, really? Issue. Wow. There. I haven't heard. Well, well I man, wanna, good guy. I want to end on a bad note. So let's tell the story about the time you introduced uh, Rick to a pretty straight-laced friend of yours who was celebrating her birthday. Oh my God. Oh yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not married I, now. I, <laughs> this is great. Rick's coming to town, and we're going to go out. And so, uh, my well, one of my exes, it's her best friend. <laughs> one of my exes. You, <laughs> you so, sound like me. It's a roll of uh, dice. So he's uh, he's coming over, and we're all going to go have a drink. And I'm like, Rick, now listen, this is a straight girl. I mean, she's a nice girl. Uh, be nice to Debbie. Don't, you know. Uh, We'll just have a few drinks. Oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. And I, I said, it's her birthday. Oh, it's her birthday, you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, a little bit later, the doorbell rings. Are you sure this was me? Yep, my, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was you. My ex says, it, it was, hey, it, Rick's here. And I, I look, as soon as he walks in and I see the trench coat, I'm thinking, uh-oh. And he comes in and uh, I hear, uh, Rick, this is Debbie. 
Oh, Debbie, I hear it's your birthday. He opens up the trench coat. There's a big bow. <laughs> and that's about it. Happy birthday. <laughs> you, you sure it wasn't Harley? <laughs> no, it wasn't Harley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm just always trying to make everybody's day have a good day, right? What a birthday oh. present. <laughs> oh. But, you know, we've had a good time. Rick and I were talking last night, you know. Who has the uh, time in life, right? Yeah, we have. And, uh, you know, to come back 30 years, and it's really sad. Uh, you know, I look at all the guys that are gone. Oh, my God. You know, and now with Dusty and, and, and yeah. Roddy and Vern. Yeah, uh, this, this I year. mean, the list goes Nick on Bockwinkle, and on. You know? Buddy Landell. I mean, it's. Uh, the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. You know? A gr last story about the Ultimate Warrior. I'll finish it with this one. When Kerry died, Helwig, Jim Helwig, the Ultimate Warrior, he's going to be a pallbearer. I'm a pallbearer. He's a pallbearer. So we get in the cart and we got, get to the gravesite. We got to carry the casket from the um, Hearst to the gravesite. Mm -hmm. So Helwig's across from me. We're on the back of the casket. Mm -hmm. So we get out and we lift the casket, and the casket is heavy as hell. Yeah. So we're walking, and you know, everybody's got a solemn look on their face, and this and that. And Hellwig looked at me, he goes, that son of a bitch. And I looked across, I'm like, what? And he goes, that son of a bitch. I said, what? And he goes, he roided up before he did this. He's heavy as shit. <laughs> I'm thinking, are you kidding me? He's the best. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Conrad Thompson, the nature of Ric Flair, and the legendary David Manning in Dallas. Okay, Dave, who wins the games today? Clemson, Oklahoma, Michigan State, Alabama. As obviously the three of us are going to the Alabama game. I Give us a pick. I personally like Alabama, and I like, uh, uh, I think it'll be uh, for the championship, Alabama's going to be playing um, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. That's your pick? That's my pick. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that comes from a guy that knows how to bet. Knows how to gamble. He's real in all those bad habits. He's actually, can I announce the fact what you're doing on Monday? Well, but be careful because of the fact that my big picks were Baylor and mm -hmm. Mississippi State. It wasn't these two games. So yeah. uh, well, I didn't always, bet them, but that. I told some friends that's okay, who I Of course, yeah, they both won big time. But, but yeah, what's happening Monday? Can, yeah. Well, no, uh, tomorrow, rather. Ooh. Yeah. At noon. Why not? Yeah, tomorrow at noon, David is getting married. Yes, I and am. And I'm going to be there, so will Conrad. After 10 years of uh, being, started being uh, happy. having the best fiancé in the world, we're, we're going to do it. Well, you know, I have a great one now, too. But, I, yeah, you know, you know I'm going to put have so much pressure on me. <laughs> Every time somebody does stupid like something like that and get married, it falls back on my lap. I know, I know you said you're going. I'm not going because I'm going to get pressure, too. So just have yeah. to send me the pictures. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it gets really bad. When well, you you're too young like and too rich to take pressure. You know, when they give you pressure, you yank the scholarship. Okay, <laughs> that's 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 the new plan. Remember what Mongo said? Mongo scholarship. Yank line. the scholarship, right? Oh, they give you baby. pressure. Me, I got a great one, lovely and everything. Oh, you're getting Couldn't, screws put to you. You don't know. Oh, it. after hey, tomorrow, are you kidding? It's I brought, all I heard yesterday. I brought both wallets today. When we get off here, Conrad and I are going to play cards with credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before before we let you go, <laughs> you brought both wallets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so By the way, we're going out tonight to Fishbones, guys, in Dallas. If you want to see us live, woo! And over to AT and T with my good friend Chris. And you'll be uh, you'll be participating in a Super Bowl celebration here, of in course, Texas. in Abilene. Yep. And uh, we got the WrestleMania tailgate. WrestleMania coming up. tailgate parties off Same and launch. Same place, yep. fish bones. Mm -hmm. Talk to us. Big about announcement this. in the new year about what you're going to be doing with my company. Everybody's going to want to get involved. Do with it. it. Come on. Well, uh, for those out there, I own two companies. One's Extreme Travel. Uh, the other one is, is called Paycation. Our motto is, why take a vacation if you can take a paycation? It's it's a network marketing company, which I've been doing ever since I left the business. You know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a huge blessing for me. Uh, I've got uh, over 40,000 reps out there around the country. Travel, have fun, save money when they do it. And they make money, make serious money. Well, I need part and, of that. Yeah, well, and that's what we're going to do. Conrad has refused to adopt me. <laughs> well, we're going to get Conrad in, too, because what we're going to do is I've got a nice key spot up at the top. I'm going to bring Rick in as my uh, good friend. We made a goal last night, one year, yeah. 100 grand a month, and uh, yeah. we're going to get a lot of you guys out there to travel around the world. If I start making grand a month, I'm getting me a boat. I'll be hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> Ship ashore. I mean, <laughs> hello, Nate. Come in. Come in. 
<laughs> so we'll be spreading the news about that okay. on one of the podcasts after the first year. Thanks, ma'am. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Manning, and our special guest, alcohol. And we didn't get in that much trouble today. <laughs> no, we didn't. No, we, we, didn't. we only had three beers apiece. We kept it mostly I know. PG. Let's, let's go over to that bar right now and get serious. We're going to like it. It's up. New Year's Eve, okay, guys? Who's Ladies the- and gentlemen, thank you so much for following Wu Nation this year. We've had a great time. I love Conrad like a brother. I love David Mann like a brother. What a great way to shut out the year and look forward to 216. Happy Thank New you Year. Guys. Thanks, guys. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. I wonder who wakes up and, and doesn't know. And for all are. you women out there oh my gosh. that miss David Mann and I on the way through, dare to dream, ladies. <laughs> Just dare to dream what you missed. And for those of you in case David and I run into you tonight, don't be afraid to live the legends. Woo-woo-woo-woo-woo-woo-woo-woo. Hey. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>